Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Addressing Skilled Labor Shortages and Decarbonization with Building Analytics. I'm Jennifer Getz, the Editorial Director with Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar is presented by Clockwork Analytics. Before we get started, I'll cover a few housekeeping items. There will be a question and answer segment at the end of the presentation today. Please find the question box in the dashboard below on your screen. This is where you could submit questions for our speaker today. Um, if at any time you experience a technical difficulty, please send us a message via that question section and someone on our team will answer you privately. Now I'm pleased to introduce your speaker for today. Um, Alex Grace is a subject matter expert in smart building technology, big data analytics, and their impacts on building operations. He currently leads the go-to market strategy execution at Clockwork Analytics, a global building analytics platform. He has spoken at many national conferences on energy efficiency and analytics, and is a published author in the textbook, Automated Diagnostics and Analytics for Buildings. Alex, thank you for being here with us today. Thanks so much. We're happy to be here. Great. So thank you all for joining. Uh, really happy to be giving this presentation today on really these two major topics in our industry across all areas of facilities management on skilled labor shortages and decarbonization. And at first glance, it might look like very different topics, right? Um, but uh, they actually have a commonality in the sense of how technology can help us address them. So we'll be talking that through in a couple different ways. So, you know, these these macro trends, these these really big areas that are affecting so much. So if we start with the labor challenges side, I'm going to start there. And before I do anything, I'm going to just grab this uh, question and answer chat box so I can see it. Okay. So a little bit of housekeeping. I know we're going to do a presentation here. There'll be lots of time for Q&A at the end. Um, it's possible we'll address the questions, though, as they come up as well, if it sort of fits the flow. So anyone on the line that has questions along the way, please do use that Q&A. We'll do our best to get to all of them, um, hopefully as many as we can in this session. All right. Very good. So let's dive in. Um, so when we talk about these two macro trends in the industry, you know, there's not a day that goes by that we don't hear something around the labor shortages side, right? There's so many different um, angles that this comes from. It affects our ability to get work done. And just to talk about a little bit of quick quotes here on what the research shows, right? So a um, couple things I want to bring up just to level set here, right? So pro FMI's 2022 FM training outlook survey I thought this was a pretty powerful survey, found that 65% of facilities management employers have reported difficulty finding individuals with their required technical skills. That's a pretty wild statistic there. Another one on the healthcare side, over 80% of healthcare facilities have reported talent shortage. That's last year, actually, that's 2022 data. Something tells me it probably hasn't changed a lot in 2023. Um, this third quote I just threw in here, but it's uh, one that really struck me in conversation with a recent large um, uh, manager uh, of a significant campus. And it said, a third of my staff could retire tomorrow. We also know from the data that appears the average age in facilities management is about 51 years old. So all of these things together, and a lot of orgs have quite a bit of challenges in um, getting the right talent and the right technical skills on their teams to address things. We also know that, that budgets are being constrained as well. There's always cost pressure. So those two things combine in um, sort of overlapping or um, you know amplifying ways, right? Having a larger effect together. So let's shift to, you know, these challenges have existed for some time, but they sort of also compound this labor picture which is according to EPA, 30% of energy in buildings is wasted. That's a big broad statistic, but point is energy efficiency still matters, right? Um, this is a additional statistic from the Center of for the Built Environment. I believe that's out of Berkeley. It says over 40% of workers are dissatisfied with the comfort in their space. Now, depending on the industry segment, comfort or, or the quality of indoor space conditions could be comfort related or they could be mission critical. Right. If we're talking about a hospital, that's actually mission critical, whether those ORs are meeting temperature and humidity set points. 
or a pharmacy space or, or any, something else in industry where those critical conditions matter quite a bit. And then the right here, over 80% of equipment fails for non-age related reasons. In other words, before end of life, before that equipment is really uh, maxed out its time frame. So um, these are kind of compounding things, right? That, that maintenance challenges mean, mean increases energy consumption. They mean issues with comfort and they mean increased capital budgeting because of the need to replace equipment before its end of life, those kind of factors there. Okay, so sticking with this theme here, we're gonna get to the decarbonization part of the story a little later, but sticking with this theme, I'm gonna transition now to talk about uh, technology a little bit, specifically fault detection and diagnostics and how building analytics um, and how technology really needs to do the heavy lifting, given all of these challenges that we're describing. There's sort of the, the mythical, you know, building engineer that can walk into the mechanical room and listen and hear the vibration and know what's going on with that pump or with that fan, et cetera. And um, we need to move from this sort of institutional knowledge to shared knowledge and for technology to help us really be a force multiplier and allow us to get more done with less because no matter how you slice it, whether it's budgeting, whether it's skilled labor shortages, we're all being asked to do that, that's for sure. So I'm gonna to transition to now just give a quick overview to level set on what fault detection diagnosis is. I'll start with how it works actually, and then kind of situate it in with um, other things, with, which with alarming and other sort of sources of data. So what I'm talking here is about buildings, of course, that have building automation systems. I'm now gonna narrow the discussion there where there are control systems, DDC, that are controlling HVAC, and we have data in those buildings. And how do we take advantage of that data to be able to address some of these challenges, okay? All right, so let's dive in a little bit to how fault detection and diagnostics works. Uh, again, just a level set. So. First and foremost, it's being able to seamlessly connect two building automation systems in a straightforward way that's scalable. So what I'm showing here is just a schematic of a building automation system with the controllers there at the bottom. And you can see the text here, it's talking about a software gateway. This is in the case of, of Clockworks, right? That's where I'm coming from. Now there are other approaches in the industry, including hardware. Our approach is to, is to use software gateway that reads that building automation system data and does an encrypted HTTPS post to the cloud. You'll notice the word outbound here. That's the critical term for IT security. Outbound only, outbound only, outbound only. If you've gone through security reviews around this topic, you know that you tend to repeat that word quite a bit. And that process takes place across a range of different open building automation protocols. Those are represented there on the bottom, BACnet or Haystack or OPC being some of the most common. So we have these control systems and buildings. We need to seamlessly get access to that data and be able to get it to a place where it can be analyzed to drive business value and to inform facilities teams uh, where their problems really are, right? So in order to do that, once that data is flowing to a cloud architecture, it's essential to model that data, to understand what it is, what that information is telling us, and what these equipment and systems are and how they should be performing, okay? So there's some components of this module, a modeling process that from a clockwork's perspective, I'm just gonna walk through pretty quickly. It's, all right, what is this equipment? It's an air handling unit. What type is it? There's an economizer in this case on this slide, right? Could be 100% outdoor air. Could be that there's heat recovery. Maybe it's a DX unit. Maybe it's not. What are all these different um, parameters that determine what this equipment is and how it's supposed to perform? And this next part here is around the points. So what are that sensor's data? What are the names of those sensors? And how do we map that to a standard naming convention um, that allows it to unlock value and be able to properly diagnose issues so our fm teams can spend less time troubleshooting and more time fixing okay and then this bottom piece are just those other parameters in the model that determine how that equipment is supposed to perform that's the control sequences and the schedule information how big is the fan how big is the pump 
what's the rate of flow of the unit. Those kind of mechanical parameters are essential for energy calculations. And energy calculations are often essential as one core form of prioritization. So something that is um, certainly a commonality across facilities teams, dealing with the range of challenges that we're talking about, um, is that we, you know, working now with thousands of buildings and hundreds and hundreds of facilities teams, have yet to hear one that is looking for another to-do list. Certainly given the, um, the challenges we described, right? Less people to do the job, um, more goals, more constraints around budgets. Um, that is not the case. No one wants another to-do list, but what people do want is priorities. And we'll come back a little bit about that prioritization core piece, right? How do you prioritize? How do you get more done and, um, and and leverage this type of technology to be a force multiplier? So from this modeling point, this is what allows us to effectively run diagnostics at scale accurately to identify what those problems are. So these different engineering analyses or diagnostics are running uh, across a range of conditions saying, hey, we're good here, we're not good there. But the essential piece here is getting to the root cause of the problem. So another to-do list means a laundry list of unprioritized faults. Um, we want to go deeper than that. In order to really be a force multiplier, this type of technology needs to get to the root cause and quantify the impact. Should I care? Should I not? So we're going to go a little deeper into this and zoom out a level from here and just talk for a second on, because you've heard a little bit about fault section. Some of you might be more or less familiar with the concept. But what is FDD and how does it relate to the other sources of data we have in a building? And what we're talking about here is what is the difference between fault detection and diagnostics, building automation alarms, and fault detection without the diagnostic piece. So this funnel is, is I think, a useful way to think about it with some descriptions here on the right, which is you've got raw data coming in. Um, most systems have alarming, right? Building automation system has that built in. And what is an alarm? An alarm tells us when a threshold has been exceeded, when a particular individual temperature has become too hot, too cold, et cetera. So it'll tell you something like my AHU, my air handling unit, has a high discharge air temperature right now. You know, straightforward alarm. When we start talking about fault detection, go a level deeper here, we're now adding the concept of time. So it's not just an individual data point exceeding a particular threshold. I'm now looking at trends of data over time. I've got more logic involved. And you might get something like, this is a, not only is it too hot, but this is a big unit. It's a big air handling unit. And that issue has been occurring for three straight days. So a little more context, more, more information that's important to be able to decide whether it's, it's an important issue or not. When we get to the diagnostic layer, now we are adding more to the equation. We're adding costs, or so the ability to quantify what this is worth, and more, more knowledge on engineering and systems to get to that root cause. So you might get an output like this. The pre-coil valve is stuck open. This is impacting all perimeter zones on the third floor, and this has wasted $315 in the last three days. So. How does this relate to labor and skill shortages? Well, I think it should be clear, right? Which is that if we have that level of pinpointing of the problems, we can get more done in the day. So that'll be a theme we'll, we'll keep addressing here. Um, so let's talk more about that as, as FDD, fault detection, and diagnostics as a force multiplier, you know, a really critical, critical piece. So if we look at maintenance in buildings and we say, well, what does ASHRAE say? Um, to t what does it take to maintain a typical building? Based on this equipment list here, uh, this would be the preventative maintenance schedule according to ASHRAE standards. 955 different PM preventative maintenance checklist items per year. Now, this is kind of the dream where all we do is preventative maintenance, but we know in the real world is that this doesn't happen um, really well because we're interrupted with reactive maintenance, which comes into play. And this level of preventative maintenance is quite rare for organizations to be able to get to, because we do a lot of firefighting. We do a lot of reacting to problems, reacting 
to building automation alarms, to comfort complaints, to um, other forms of, hey, the problem has already occurred and we got to respond now to address it. And we know that that's the most expensive form of maintenance, of course, is that reactive maintenance and the value of proactive. So what does this look like if we have building analytics, if we have fault protection and diagnostics running? You know, so when you have FTD software in the picture, it means you now have automated analyses, automated checks running on each of these equipment every day. So in the example of this equipment list, we're looking at about 4,000 automated checks every day as opposed to about a thousand checklist items per year. And the point there obviously is to, to pinpoint the problems that are worthwhile, to pinpoint the problems that your in-house staff and vendors uh, can take care of to be able to drive more value in less time, okay? So to go a little deeper here, you know, around this concept, so, you know, if we think about it kind of a level zero, we've got a traditional PM program. Once a quarter, we do this. You know, we, we check alarms. We maybe check the chiller refrigerant pressures, the compressor levels on the boilers. We're looking at the combustion chambers, the burner, burners, the flues. We're replacing filters, greasing bearings, you name it. All the standard preventative maintenance type items that are happening on a time-based schedule. If we can go to another level here with fall detection and diagnostics, we're able to now incorporate that in. So, hey, particularly in a truck roll scenario, we're rolling a truck to that site, rather than just going through that checklist items, let's incorporate the top five issues from FDD. So that's what that screenshot below there is showing. It's an example of that. And make sure that we're hitting those top items um, as a part of that process that we fit it in. Another way to say that is, hey, if we're gonna go up on the roof, we're gonna get in that mechanical room, get in that unit, let's have the holistic picture as to what's going on and fix everything right then rather than kind of continuing the meeting to go back to the to the uh, inflate whack-a-mole with that equipment, okay? When we go another level here, we're talking about a building operations center. This is of course only applicable or appropriate for certain types of organizations that have a larger portfolio and have some kind of centralization of resources. But I'm going to pause here in a second because it's, I think, something really powerful that we are seeing more and more orgs look at. Because as you have those skilled labor shortages, it means that particularly in distributed portfolio, where you may have a chief engineer at some sites that have more experience than others. I shouldn't say may, I say you will have that case, right? Any distributed portfolio you may have some really experienced chief engineer here, but on this other site, you know, our main guy just retired or someone just left for another job and we're trying to fill that gap. So the concept here that we're seeing more and more orgs look at is to say, let's look at a centralization of resources. What if we take that engineer we have who's really fantastic or maybe has more skills than others and let's elevate them to a regional level or to a national level, leveraging fault section and diagnostics, they're now able to have eyes and ears out there able to look across the portfolio and see problems, delegate that work and be at air support, be able to be a resource to maybe less experienced technicians or engineers on those individual locations. Um, so we can pinpoint the problems at a regional or national level. We can delegate that work and we can assist people on the ground in getting more done faster with this kind of approach. So I think that's something that is really logical it makes a lot of sense. It's having a lot of business value to address this um, labor issue and allow FTD to do some of that heavy lifting. Um, what's the results of all this? You know, do we have any data? What does it show? Really amazing some work that the, some of the national labs have been doing around what is the impact of all this? So I wanna highlight that for a second around energy and operational savings. So this is specifically about the use um, of fall detection and diagnostics. So on the left, this is a really powerful campaign that if you haven't looked at this before, I'd really encourage you to smart energy analytics campaign. If you Google that, it'll come up right away. And that's a program run from LBNL, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, funded by US Department of Energy. And they did an extremely powerful three-year campaign and study where in the end, they analyzed 600 million square feet of projects that have used what they call EMIS, Energy Management and Information Systems, 
which includes two core types of technology. EIS, that's energy information systems. In other words, meter data analytics. And then FDD, fault detection and diagnostics. And with FDD, that's what the numbers you're looking at here are reflective of. That they found median savings rates of 6% year one, climbing to 9% year two, 13% year three. It goes up even higher from there. So really powerful validation across so much square footage that's been analyzed to say the results of this are very significant on the energy front. Now we're gonna talk in a minute about strategic energy management, about um, the role, uh, how this affects decarbonization and the goals on that side of the house. And one of the really key pieces here, of course, is that energy efficiency has been a topic for a long time. There's now another dimension, which is not just what energy can we save in this building, but every watt, every kilowatt, every KBTU that we save in this building is now also a KBTU or a, or a, or a KWH that we don't need to decarbonize in the future. So more and more organizations that have those decarbonization plans, it really adds to the value of that operational energy reduction because it's potentially voiding capital projects down the road to actually decarbonize. On the right-hand side, another powerful study from PNNL, Pacific Northwest National Labs, on their O&M best practices report, showing the power of proactive and predictive maintenance here of elimination of breakdowns, reduction in downtime, reduction in maintenance spend, and uh, in environments where it's relevant, increased in production, you know, industrial environments. So the data, the research, really clear. Love the work these national labs are doing to help validate that. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears for a second from the, the labor side, just to talk about um, strategic energy management. And, Let's uh, let's do that here. So uh, when we look at, you know, just the overall process for being able to make these organizational level commitments, I think this is not an uncommon scenario today, right? Uh, we have leadership saying, hey, we're committed to being net zero by 2050, or you name the, the time frame, some, some commitment to that effect. And then the operations team is sort of left with saying, uh, okay, how, right? Like, how? How does that affect our world? So it's a bit of a framework here on the left that um, makes a lot of sense. It starts with that commitment. And then we move on to assessing performance and setting goals, setting targets. Usually that's getting our arms around what the baseline is. What is our consumption? And EIS is essential to that. Energy information system type dashboard. I'm showing a screenshot here from Clockworks, what we call energy insights, looking at energy use intensity, breaking it down by utility type, being able to analyze by building, what is our EUI? What is our energy consumption? How does it compare to baseline? Where are we at, right? We have to assess performance in order to set goals from there. And in order to create uh, an action plan, um, we need to know where the issues are. Now, if we look at where are the ways, what are the ways to do that? We can do auditing, we can do a lot of manual processes, but again, um, harder and harder to do that in-house, given those labor challenges, and very expensive and costly to do as a one-time project like we used to do. So a big role for technology to play here. We're going to look at this live, actually, in a second, an example of fault detection diagnostics and being able to prioritize those issues and define them. And we want to roll that up to look at uh, operational priorities across the board to be able to really analyze uh, not just energy impact, but the maintenance uh, performance and those comfort performances across the board. So an example there of that from a dashboarding level um, and create that plan. So what are those top 10 issues per building that we know we need to address? So we'll come back to that. Okay, once we've identified what those problems are, how do we get them into a workflow that can be ultimately save time? So taking those issues to the level of a diagnostic report we, I'm not going to spend too much time here on these slides because we're going to look at this live. And we can have that diagnostic report really specifically define exactly what the problems are and how to go fix them. So again, coming back to that um, labor scenario, if we know, if we have a quick list of not just the problem, but the possible causes, 
you know, we can save a lot of time in that troubleshooting. Our mantra has really become working with facilities teams, less time troubleshooting, more time fixing. Really essential. And that requires getting to that root cause, identifying those problems and being able to create tasks easily or work orders, which is what you're seeing here, um, to actually implement that action plan. Once we've implemented actions, we need to, of course, evaluate progress. You know, did they work the way we expected them to work? So need, automating the validation of those kind of completed work orders becomes uh, a really powerful thing to do. So a little graphic here showing, hey, work order created. We had all this energy waste. We completed the work order on that day. Uh, can we see, we should be able to see the impact, right? We should see the impact right away. The data doesn't lie. So closing the loop there is, is really essential. And there's two things we hear from teams on this. You know, just because we close a work order in the field does not mean that we've actually solved the problem necessarily. We hope we did, but we may not always have solved it. So if that's in-house staff and, and the issue was not resolved the way we expected, that becomes an important training opportunity. So I didn't use this word yet, but it's an important one, which is upskilling, right? Being able to upskill our technical talent, particularly if we have more junior team members, um, is a really important area and training is essential. And doing that in real time and saying, hey, that work order got closed. It didn't actually address the problem according to the data. Let's look at it closer. That kind of process. Um, recognition, really essential here as well, being able to demonstrate that. Okay, so I'm gonna transition now into the live demo part of this. Um, and if there's any questions so far in the presentation, please do feel free to drop those in the chat. All right. Let's pull this in. We've talked about a lot of concepts, covering a lot of ground, jumping between the labor challenges and uh, the decarbonization goals and the role that fall detection and diagnostics plays in being a force multiplier. So let's go in here to, I'm gonna change my date range real quick. Let's grab the last 30 days. And I'm gonna show an example of a diagnostic grid so we can really demonstrate the power of that and how to get more done with less. Less time troubleshooting, right? More time fixing. So you're looking here at a diagnostic grid. If we look left to right, and I'm gonna maybe zoom in a little here so folks can see this easily. Um, we're looking at the building name, the equipment name, the type of analysis or diagnostic that ran, a notes description as to what in fact has been found. So we ran a diagnostic, we looked through hundreds of possible conditions, and what's been found is now going to appear here in the notes, and we need to quantify that. Should I care? Should I not? Well, yes, I should, because it's cost us $27,000 in the past month. That's a sum, in this case, over the time frame we are looking at of the excess energy or the energy waste associated with the group of problems here. So what's been found here specifically is a leaking preheat coil valve, a return relative humidity that's higher than set point, a return RH set point that's below suggested minimum. We've got simultaneous heating and cooling going on and supply temperature reset errors. So this is a range of operational inefficiencies or maintenance priorities here that have been identified automatically and quantified in terms of their relative importance, not just in terms of the energy, but if we move continue down these rows or these columns here, what is the comfort impact and the maintenance impact becomes very important as well particularly those that are focused on indoor air quality or avoiding the phone from ringing on complaints. And then we want to trend that over time. That's really powerful as well. Well, what is this doing per day? You can see those dollar values changing because in this case, this set of issues is weather dependent. It's based on um, the outdoor conditions. It's gonna affect how much energy is being wasted on these particular days. And I might want to know as well, well, is there a work order already open to address this problem or not? So that's what this column is telling me. And do we have any tasks completed or not? Have we completed a work order on this set of issues? 
I can also resort this list by other priorities. Right now, we're looking by energy. We're seeing leaky valves and simultaneous heating and cooling and loop low delta Ts and uh, issues on the cooling side, abnormal fan current, excess mechanical cooling on an economizer, all sorts of issues relative to high energy, excess energy consumption. But we can, in fact, resort that list by the maintenance priority or the comfort priority as well. So if I'm focused on, you know, what can I fix today to avoid a headache tomorrow, I may want to prioritize on that maintenance finding as an example here. So that's what I just did. Now we're looking from a maintenance standpoint. So whether there's an energy issue or not, if we have a flat sensor on a boiler, that's important to fix because otherwise we've lost control of, our, of that boiler or low flu O2 levels, or here, our cooling source is off, but the chilled water pumps are on. That's a problem. Let's address that um, from a maintenance standpoint. So the different levels of prioritization are really key. And then, uh, you know, we can go to comfort as well, which is the uh, building occupant area. Now, again, for certain types of buildings, that's not just creature comfort. That could be really critical spaces that, that you want to understand what, what could affect. Um, the reality of maintenance is that it's not a question of if the dampers will stick, the sensors will break, the um, uh, the loops will become underloaded, right? These things will happen over time. It's a question of when. Mechanical degradation happens. That's why we have maintenance. But things can become an edelman haystack pretty quick until we have to be reactive. So let's bring that to our attention quickly. I'm going to take another couple minutes and just dive into an individual report here while we're in this diagnostic, and then we can um, look at some other kind of use case environments. So let's look at one of these a little closer. So if we click in, we get a full report. What um, what people notice about that report is that it's it's really aggregating different findings together, and that's really important because you don't want to have a laundry list and sort of have to connect the dots manually, want to allow software to do that heavy lifting and be able to get to those to those root causes. So the support in this example is, is not an uncommon example here of simultaneous heating and cooling. And um, what you'll see on the screen are a list of problems and their associated possible causes. So it tells us the pre-coil and cooling coil are providing excess heating or cooling or operating simultaneously. And this may have wasted $900 that day, actually very specifically 923, 527 from the heating side, 396 from the cooling side, total number of KBTUs. So again, you know, it, it, what's the relative importance here? This list of possible causes is not uh, static, it's actually dynamic. So it's about getting to those issues and really saying, where do I start as a technician? You know, where do I start? Well, let's start with that valve and see if it's leaking or stuck. Now, it's not always the case that preheat coil valve is leaking as the first possible cause of simultaneous heat. It is here because this problem within this diagnostic is aware of this problem. That heating is occurring when that valve says it's closed. I'm sure we have different levels of um, uh, technical folks on the line, so I, I don't want to go too deep here. But you know what what it means is that we have water going through this hot water coil when we shouldn't. Therefore, the average temperature rise, while the valve said it was closed and the fault was occurring, was 13 degrees. So all it takes is one valve to leak to have a very significant impact on energy consumption in the building. Uh, this particular example is looking at about $200,000 in the course of a year. Now, it's a very large air handler. There's a reason it was selected for demonstration purposes, but it is a real case. So these small mechanical degradations can have really major effects. And we want to direct resolution pretty quickly. Okay, so problem statements, possible causes. I'm, I'm picking a few here to focus on rather than going through them all. But we have issues on relative humidity, on supply temperature um, set points. So we're not resetting, so we want to be, have that set point be modulating based on, uh, in this case, the return air conditions. So there's an expected return air reset schedule. That's a common energy conservation measure. And again, just because it was programmed perfectly two years ago doesn't mean it's being followed today. 
or just because it was programmed perfectly yesterday doesn't mean something didn't happen today. So picking up on those kind of issues, it can have a big effect. And then we want all the graphical information associated with the same report to validate that text. So an operator can look at a report like this, can validate the data without having to manually create these graphs in their building automation system. And they're able to um, really pinpoint the problem pretty quickly. So if I go ahead and create a task here, uh, you can see how many graphs are here. All of these are dynamically generated. So all the text that we looked at and all the graphs are, are automatically created by the expert system here to pinpoint these problems. And once I go through that, I can now create that task. Common questions, I'll set it off right now, is, hey, can this integrate with my work order system? Can this integrate with my CMMS? And the answer is yes. You'll see this create work order button here. So I can assign this out to a user. I can decide the status, tell what should be done, and I can even create a work order if I have that handshake in place so that we can actually send that task directly into a work order to be resolved, okay? Um, very good. Now, having that handshake or the duplication of effort, having the task here within FDD is very important because by doing that, I now have a digital record of that history. It's quite a common thing what we're talking about around the upskilling conversation you know, it, it's a common management thing to look here and say, hey, it looks like we keep generating work orders on this piece of equipment. We keep fixing problems and they keep coming back. So having that visibility is key because not only is this costing energy every time the issue pops back, but we're costing, it's costing us labor spend and material spend as well. So it's quite common to say, hey, you know, we've been abandoning this issue. We need to come up with a deeper fix. So we're resetting the actuator. We're not replacing it. We are fixing the valve, but we haven't replaced it. Those kind of things become become really easy to start to see here. To be able to make that management level decision and having a deeper fix. That's really key. Um, very good. So I see a question here and I'm actually gonna gonna respond to it. So thanks for asking it, Ted, because it is uh it, it's it's very relevant to, to where we are at this point in the presentation. So the question is, one of the challenges of um, that facility officers have is explaining to management the cost of maintenance. Um, FDD, while FDD helps reduce costs, your demonstration shows there are savings possible with FDD. Is there a way to aggregate all the positive actions and savings documented in the system so a supportive report can be provided to management so they understand the positive aspects of maintenance versus cost? Thank you for the question, absolutely. And it's a good segue here because if we now create these tasks and we close them, we can now document the energy savings that was had as a result of that action. So let's go ahead and look at some dashboarding that do just that. Um, all of these individual results can be aggregated in different types of dashboards to meet different use cases. And some dashboards might be really simple and executive focused that do exactly, Ted, what you asked and say, hey, here's what we saved as a result of this program. By the way, we find this one, of the, we hear that this is one of the most powerful things of all this, because the reality is, to your point, maintenance teams are fixing things every day that do have a big impact on the bottom line. But being able to demonstrate that is a real challenge because you have to do a whole engineering project to figure out, all right, well, we fixed a lot of work orders today, but what did that save us? Well, I don't know. I mean, we have to do a whole study to figure that out. If Clockworks is in the picture and you're quantifying it, you now have that automated. So let's jump to some dashboards and we'll we'll look at that. Um, let's start here. This is an example of an executive summary. I'm actually looking here across 25 million square feet, across 98 buildings, across 12,800 equipment. And all those tasks have now been rolled up to really track results. So in this example, there's 792 completed tasks with a lifetime savings number in this case of almost $2.5 million, as well as carbon. So shame on me, we focus this webinar is decarbonization and I haven't talked about that piece. So it's not only quantifying the energy, but the carbon as well. In fact, you can actually 
um, in that diagnostic grid I just showed, you can sort things by carbon impact as well. And by the way, it's not a one-to-one, -one, especially if you have a distributed portfolio across the board. We're always impressed when we, when we look at this analysis with clients and we can see that, yeah, we wasted a lot more energy uh, dollars over here, but this building is in a particular state where the mix of, of CO2 on the grid is much more carbon intensive. Let's say we have more coal on the grid, et cetera. And um, it's not always the case energy cost equals carbon, right? They can be very different analyses. So depending on how organizations are motivated, and we're seeing more and more facilities teams, at, well, I'd say, especially on a portfolio or national level, be really motivated by the decarbonization piece and say, hey, we're going to start prioritizing work based on that impact. So quantifying not just the dollar savings, but the CO2 equivalent savings in tons of carbon as well. And I've just got, this is an example. So all of this is super flexible. This is all customizable. There's templates for this. So things like, hey, what, are, what is my aging task count? Um, how many tasks are we creating by month, completing by month? I have 425 open, ongoing tasks worth 1.7 million in potential savings and worth, worth 4,000 tons of potential carbon savings. So a very powerful to track that and, and really help empower facilities teams and maintenance teams to quantify the impacts they're having by fixing these problems. Um, Bunch of other, uh, bunch of other types of possibilities here on how those diagnostic results roll up. So, how are we doing by building? What are our what what buildings have the most amount of problems? Not just looking at the bills, not just looking at the meters, but actually having those diagnostics run in every single piece of equipment and rolling that up. How about maintenance score? That might be different than energy. You know, what's our relative performance by building? In terms of maintenance, this data is being analyzed every five minutes. Diagnostics are running every day. Well, last quarter, last month, last week, last year, how are our buildings comparing to each other? That can be really powerful. And we can create some, uh, you know, maybe some positive, um, positive competition, right? We see a lot of larger facilities organizations that like to create some healthy competition, you know? Um, that could be powerful. Who, who's the most improved? You know, even something as simple as giving awards out at the end of the year, which which sites were the most improved? You know, who saved the most amount of energy? You know, you can now create that kind of portfolio level visibility and, and create that that healthy competition dynamic. So there's a lot here within um, dashboardings um, to show. Again, this is all all automated. Um, I see a question here I can address. Thank you. It says, does this system run with your IWMS or does it replace it? It does not replace it. There is tasking functionality. Oh, uh, there is tasking functionality that you can see here that we talked about, right? And there's a whole module here specific to that task. Um, but typically, you can think about a task as a one-to-one -one relationship with a work order in an IWMS or in a CMMS. So that handshake, that integration piece is very important. We have a lot of documentation on how you do it. It's all via API. So to connect the dots there and make sure that the, that the task create work orders and the change in the status of the work order then updates this type of dashboard so you can see you know, this type of report. Very good. Um, another question here, can you tap into standard buildings at NREL or other national labs? And their, um, and their energy consumption and present how organizations are better or worse than similar facilities. That's a really interesting idea. Um, no, but I, but I like where you're thinking. Benchmarking is, is a really common, it's a really powerful thing, right? So I, I think the value of what you're describing is, is very strong. Um, it's definitely a challenge because of so many nuances in buildings, right? In terms of their consumption. I'll tell you something that we are planning in the future. Clockworks has live connectivity now to over 3,000 buildings, over 430,000 mechanical assets. It's over 500 million square feet of space. And actually, I can just show that live. So this is a live dashboard across the entire connected portfolio on anonymized. So what's powerful to me is rather than just have one reference building, because there's so many differences in how buildings operate. It's really hard to have an apples to apples thing. 
but we have the vision to be able to have anonymized data sets within our interface directly that would allow buildings to compare their performance not only to other buildings within their portfolio, but also to anonymized averages or medians or other type of statistics to say, hey, is this a normal number of indoor air quality issues that I have in this building compared to others? What about my maintenance score? Um, energy dollars wasted. Am I within a normal range or not? So I think that's a great thought and, and something we're, we're thinking a lot about. How do we enable, uh, and I won't get into all the details, but what that looks like is creating anonymized data sets because we already have all this data aggregated and there's a lot of power there. So being able to create that anonymized data set to be able to benchmark against. Thank you for the question. Uh, okay, so let's look at some other use cases here. And please keep the questions coming. Uh, it's really helpful to be able to respond to, to what's on your minds here. So we looked at one dashboarding type. I'm gonna shift to another one here, which is a slightly different angle, which is new construction. So connecting the dots here with new construction is very powerful. There's kind of a classic dynamic in our industry, right? Which is the construction team builds a building, passes it off to operations and maintenance, Operations and maintenance says the building never worked well from day one. The construction team says that it worked great. The operations teams are the ones that messed it up, right? So we want to reduce finger pointing if we can. Having FDD from day one really helps to reduce that finger point. This is an example of a dashboard that some of our clients use. We have one major client that uses as a national standard. Every building, every retrofit they do, they call it the commissioning bill of health. And it says, hey, if we have a new building or a major retrofit here, we shouldn't have any cycling faults, damper faults, sensor faults, or valve faults. And if we do, let's know about that immediately while we're under warranty and hold vendors accountable to be able, during that warranty period to fix these issues. We also wanna ensure that we pass that building to operations and maintenance, that there aren't problems from day one, that we've validated it, and, and again, can address, address the warranty. Because the way commissioning typically works, we are doing a snapshot in time. So if we come in a particular day and test the systems, what's to ensure the problem didn't just appear tomorrow? It didn't happen today, it happened the next day, right? And just as a quick visual of that, you know, why does that matter so much? If I go back to um, this diagnostic grid, you know, let's look at some of these spark charts of when problems were occurring. So you can see it, sometimes the issue is happening every day, but oftentimes it's not. So it could very well be the case that the problem was happening and then it wasn't, and then it came back. So supply airflow was too low here. I was good on these days. Now, why was it intermittent? It could be a range of reasons for that. It could be that the issue is only happening on weekends, or maybe it's only happening during certain outdoor weather conditions and not others, right? You can see the amount of variability in these charts which tells us that doing commissioning on a snapshot of time is really not enough. It doesn't mean we're gonna hit all the problems. And doing that manually is expensive. So rather than that, having the commissioning firm actually leverage a tool like this in their process, but not be limited by it, meaning that we can have visibility into where the problems are and then have punch lists associated. So here's my list of cycling issues. If I'm a building owner, operator, I'm gonna pass that list of cycling issues directly to my controls vendor to fix. And maybe that's, you know, so I'm talking about new construction here, but this, this could also be very relevant for supercharging the vendor maintenance and service contracts that you have. So when that vendor shows up, do you know that they are working on the top priorities and the most impactful items in the building or not, right? Most people would say, no, they show up, they go through a checklist, they do what my site guy tells them to do, um, but we don't know necessarily where all the problems are. Now, if you have clockworks in the picture, if you have FDD that's effective, you can give that prioritized list and have that visibility to, hey, the vendors that are responsible for those systems, let's make sure that they're fixing these things as part of those contracts. That can also be a really cost-effective way to deal with some of those labor challenges, but more and more people are pushing, because of that challenge, they're pushing more work to their vendors. 
And if you're pushing more budget to your vendors, you want to make sure that that budget is being spent as cost effectively as possible. And that means that you're addressing those top priorities. Very good. Uh, we have about nine minutes left. So if you're thinking about a question you haven't asked it yet, I would encourage you to do so. And I'll go to a couple other um, dashboards here in the time that we have left. Let's talk about decarbonization again. So this is a dashboard focused on CO2 savings. As an example, I've got a list of buildings here, the amount of square footage that's monitored, how much equipment are we looking at, you know, how, ma how much carbon savings have we achieved? So just narrowing into that use case, what potential do we have to achieve carbon savings? Now, if you think about your IWMS, your CMMS, you got a lot of work orders out there, but do you know which ones have a carbon impact and which ones don't? Which ones have a big dollar value impact and which ones don't? Very hard to know, right? We don't know that until we have the analytics in the picture driving it. So this becomes a really powerful layer on top um, to help make decisions. Decision support might be a word for it. And then, you know, what is the trend over time? All different ways to kind of analyze uh, that carbon. What about breaking it down? What equipment are we having the most carbon opportunity in? What buildings have the most carbon savings, CO2 savings in? So we could be looking across the portfolio in this example, 2.8 million square foot portfolio. And what is the, the top five equipment that's having the biggest impact on our CO2 emissions? Which buildings are having the biggest impact that we want to direct resources to? So having that level of prioritization is really key. Okay, there's always more to show. That's the challenge here. We can, we can talk all day, but um, I know we have this, this nice hour and, and I want to respect that so that people can, um, we're really glad that you're able to join. So any, any additional questions, um, please mm. feel free to bring them up now. And Alex, thank you so much for this presentation and this demonstration. Of course, thank you to all our attendees for sending in questions. And like Alex said, we have a couple more minutes here. So if you have any more questions, we do have a couple questions that um, have come in that I would just like to ask you, Alex. Um, sure. So how is the data within the diagnostic report created? Yeah, so the data is coming in from build, so the data is coming in from building automation systems to be able to run those diagnostics, and then from there we're able to because of that model approach talked about at the beginning, it's kind of a big topic. We're able to select what do we want to demonstrate here within these widgets and on these dashboards. So what equipment do I want to look at? What buildings are important to me? So all those data sets are now structured, but it all comes back to the configuration of that initial model. What are these points? coming from building automation systems and any, any other important parameters associated with the equipment. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, another question we have here is, um, how long does it take to implement all the data needed into the system? Um, is Does it take a lot of time to set up? Great question. Typical timeline is 90 days mm -hmm. from the time um, there's access to the building automation system to the time the diagnostics or the model is totally created and diagnostics are fully running. Mm -hmm. So perfect. So I think we have time for maybe one or two questions here, but one other question um, from Mary is, we are already overwhelmed by BMS alarms. Um, how does this not add to the noise? <laughs> Good question, Mary. So it does not add to the noise because the same things that, so if you have a thousand BAS alarms today, that's the same thing as having zero alarms, mm -hmm. right? Because there's no prioritization there. It's just a mess of, of alerts. This is cutting through that noise and saying, should I care or should I not? I care if it's costing me a thousand dollars. Maybe I don't care if it's costing me one dollar, right? So alarms do not give you that prioritization that fault detection and diagnostics does. Mm -hmm. Good question. <laughs> great, great. Um, and then one more question here. Um, you know, John is asking from your experience, um, how are organizations doing when it comes to reaching their net zero energy goals? In the process you have outlined, is there any area that organizations struggle with more than others? Uh, big topic. Um, I would say, how are people doing? I think a lot of organizations are having a oh shit moment and saying, how do we tackle this effectively? Right. Um, so it's definitely a big challenge. 
Um, you know, I think that oftentimes what I've, what I've really been focusing on here is, of course, operational sustainability and the role that operations plays in meeting those net zero goals. I think usually you sit in on a, on a net zero meeting, it's really capital planning discussions. It's, all right, how are we going to convert the natural gas in this central plant to electric? How do we electrify? How do we do that? What we have to make sure of is that operations has a critical voice because we know that we can have the most efficient building in the world, but if we drive it with the gas and the brake on at the same time, we're not going to get the results that we're looking for. And it's easy from a, from a, if you're a little far, if you're a little removed from this operations equation, you might think of operations as just a line item, right? It's just kind of a static thing, but it's not. How we operate the buildings have a tremendous swing on what that carbon CO2 consumption is uh, or what the, the dollars spent are. So, of course, capital planning is central in that net zero discussion, but we can't forget operations at the same time. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Alex, it looks like we are just about out of time. Um, if we were unable to answer your question today, um, we will share it with the Clockwork Analytics team and they will address it at a later time. Um, thank you again, Alex, for this discussion today. And thank you to Clockwork Analytics for sponsor sponsoring this webinar. Um, of course, special thank you to our audience for attending today. A recording from today's session will be made available on our magazine's website, facilityexecutive.com and at clockworkanalytics.com. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Bye. <laughs>